room, I grew up being really engaged uh, with computers. And being someone who was engaged with computers, I was incredibly socially popular and, uh, and, 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 and good with the ladies. Um, but actually, this, this time, about 1988, was a great time to be this kid. Because, of course, we were that generation who were the first generation to get home computers. And I grew up very much in an Apple household. Now, the Apple on the left and not the Apple on the right. The Apple before somebody said, can you suck all the color out of it and freeze it into ice? And this is a, a different Apple from the one that we experience today. And it was an Apple that was driven as much by uh, this guy on the left as it was by this guy on the right. Does anybody know who that is? Bill Atkinson, great crowd. Most people say Wozniak, which is terrible. Um, and, and really specifically, I want to talk about one thing that Bill Atkinson was responsible for, and that's hypercar. Uh, yeah, a round of applause. You can see how far Apple's interface has evolved since HyperCard. We're right back where we started again with the iPad. Now, HyperCard was a program that people would use to make small software. Things like um, a program to track basketball scores for their local basketball team. Or maybe a calculator to help them out with, with very simple calculations. Or a program that would help them in their research. And of course, people were also using HyperCard to make artwork. This is one of my favorite ones uh, called If Monks Had Max by Brian Thomas. It was this kind of linear, uh, non-linear storytelling format which, which let you explore this strange world of science and mathematics. And Brian Thomas has this really great quote which I, which I dug up when I was putting together this talk. And, and I know that you guys can read it, so I'm not going to read the quote. But, but the, if I was going to pick a phrase that was going to come up from this quote, is this phrase of code punk, this idea of making software without the weight of profit behind it. And that has a lot to do with what I want to talk about with small software. So I make small software as a software artist. This is a program called The Color Economy, which is a simulated economy in which pixels trade color, red, green, and blue. It's an agent-based system meant to get us talking about economies. And sometimes these things are a little more practical. Um, this next one is, is a visualization of all the planets that the Kepler project discovered. And this is something that I made in about four or five hours with no other intention other than to allow myself to learn a little bit more about this system. I wasn't trying to start a company or build an app. I was just trying to build um, software, so a very small piece of software. And this very small piece of software let me address that system of information in a way that couldn't be done with a big piece of software. Because that piece of, of, of data has character all of its own. These are planets. They're not things that can be normally um, uh, uh, visualized. Another example, a much bigger example, I, I built an algorithm and a software tool which allowed it, um, the architects to place the nearly 3,000 names that are on the 9-11 memorial in Manhattan. But here is a very specific piece of data that has a very specific context. And big software cannot attack a problem like this. It cannot solve a problem like this. Only small software can. I work at the New York Times where I'm the data artist in residence. And what we've learned at the, at the New York Times is that we can build these bespoke, these custom tailored systems that can uniquely engage with specific systems. Rather than thinking about giant pieces of software that can engage with every system, we think about small pieces which can engage in small systems. One of the nice things, though, about small software is that small software can become big software. Big software cannot become small software, but small software can become big software. So we started this project in the Times um, last year called Cascade. And what Cascade is, is it's a tool which lets us look at how Times content is shared through social media. Now, Times content is has its own character. There, there's something about Times content that means that people are sharing it quite a lot. So a single event like this event that we see right here can grow into many events. I'm going to show you three views of the same system. This is all from a story that was published last year um, shortly after Steve's job's death. Here is uh, a side view, what we call of an event cascade, which is all resulting. This is about 16 hours of traffic from, from one particular event that cascaded into another event. Here's another view of it that we call radar view, which allows us to see these threads of conversation which carry through the system. And this is a, a real-time tool. It's an exploratory tool. And, and these stills don't really do it justice. Neither does this next one, which is a, which is a video of the system. Because in real life, this runs on a five-screen video wall. And, and it's controlled by an iPhone. And people can go through and, and, and explore the nearly 7,000 pieces of content that the Times publishes every month and how people are engaging with those pieces. 
And so this idea of, of, of small software, I think, is really important. And, and, and big software, it, 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 it doesn't accomplish the, um, the ability to examine the character of, of these problems that are really important to engage with. Thank you.